أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of God, most merciful, ever merciful And may God's peace and blessings be upon his holy prophet Muhammad and the purified members of his household and progeny Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum Brothers, sisters and dear respected viewers Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and thank you for joining us once again on this series on the topic of the afterlife where we are continuing to uh, explore the relationship between this world and the next world uh, in a series of uh, lectures uh, and this topic is uh, more or less wrapped up and inshallah uh, we are going to uh, ask, I think, an important question or a couple of, of important questions today uh, and we will try to answer them uh, which will allow us, inshallah, to uh, start putting uh, the, the entire topic not only of the afterlife but of the belief system uh, in perspective. As you will see, this topic has ramifications on the rest of the, uh, the, the series of the belief system in general. Uh, and the afterlife specifically as well. So the topic for today uh, is entitled uh, the uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's favors uh, or neutrality. In another way, if we want to put this question uh, in, in a simpler language, the big question that we currently have is does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stand, uh, as they say, equidistantly in the, to the same distance between those things that lead the human being to eternal happiness as he does to those things that may lead to his unhappiness and punishment? Or does he favor one of these positions more than the other? That's the big question. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the manner in which he has created us, the manner in which he has uh, dealt with the creation of the entire system in which we live, uh, in the manner in which he has revealed religion to us, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala neutral in how a human being is to act or is he incentivizing? Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pushing the human being in one direction more than the other? That's what we're trying to uh, answer uh, in today at the end of this lecture, inshallah. So as a quick recap, and I think because we haven't done one of these recaps in a while, it might be worthwhile to kind of uh, uh, walk us very quickly through what we have covered until now. When we began this series, we were asking the question uh, of whether the human being is simply limited to, uh, whether the human being is simply limited to their bodily physical existence or is there something more in the human being and we said in short that a human being is not only made up of a body and a soul we said that the true existence and the true nature of the human being can only be understood by understanding that the human being is first and foremost a spiritual entity that has a body which is very different from saying that we are the, uh, the, the body and then we have a soul. We said, no, the proper way of understanding a human being is to say that the human being is actually the soul and we also have a body that goes with it. And we're not gonna repeat you know, everything that we said there, but this opens the door to our entire discussion on the entire series of the afterlife. If a human being has an immaterial dimension, an immaterial, non-material component to their nature, this begs the question of whether this entity also dies when the human being dies or not. And we said that that non-material entity actually continues to live. It has nothing to do with the death of the body. Yes, the instrument that is used to deal with the material world is no longer operative, operational in this world, but the human being continues to exist in the same way as they existed before. The only difference is that the tool, the instrument, the means with which they could interact 
uh, and live and experience this world is no longer there. And so they move on to the afterlife. And this allowed us to enter into the entire topic of the afterlife. And we said that it is one of the most important pillars in every belief system, in every worldview. Without finding a proper answer to this question, we do not really have a full worldview. A full worldview must include elements of where do we come from, the question of the origin, the question of, uh, as usual, what are we doing in this world and where are we headed, which is the question of the ultimate destiny of our existence. Any worldview, which is, in other words, one way to say any religion, must be able to provide an answer to these questions. And the more a human being acquires maturity in this life, the more these questions become pressing because these are the questions that are going to give the answers to these questions is what's going to give direction to the life and to the choices and to the behavior of a human being in this world. And this gives meaning to the existence of the human being in this world and beyond this world, depending on whether they believe in a, something beyond this world or not. So as we said, once this is established, then we ask the question, is it simply a matter that there is, there can be an afterlife? And the conclusion there is that, is, was that not only can there be an afterlife, an afterlife is actually necessary. And we gave a number of rational reasons, in addition to which we added scriptural or devotional reasons. We said, in addition to the fact that our own reason, human reason, reaches a conclusion very clearly that there must be an afterlife. There must also be, if we look at religion, we see that revelation also clearly establishes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly establishes in the scriptures that he has made a promise that there will be an afterlife in which those who did good are going to be rewarded and those who did bad are going to be punished. And this will be done through justice. We then looked at the nature of this world. And we compared the nature of this world with the nature of the afterlife. And a few points are worth mentioning here. One of them is that we saw that human reason uh, can very clearly experience uh, its shortcomings and its limitations in trying to understand the details associated with the afterlife. Because there is no way for us to experience the afterlife, to experiment on the afterlife. It is beyond our tools beyond our means. And so for the details, we must rely on what scripture, what revelation, what religion is going to give us. And in fact, when we had talked about the philosophy of religion, the philosophy of revelation, the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would ever send a religion to human being, prophets to human being, one of the main reasons is that human beings on their own are incapable of knowing the afterlife. There is no access to the afterlife. So you need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to tell you directly because you have no access to it. It's not like when you experience nature on this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need to reveal to you the laws of chemistry or the laws of physics because these are things that he has equipped you to go and explore and study and find the answers on your own. But there are other things that you can never reach those conclusions on your own, such as the nature of the afterlife. And for those things, you must rely on revelation. You must rely on religion, on scripture, directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the other point related to the nature of this world is that when we look at how it is built and how it is engineered, we see that it is not a just world. It is a world of limitations. It is a world of competition. But all of this has a reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created it this way so that it can be used properly as a platform, as a stage to test our free will. Because we have free will, then there must be the reason to act well with good intentions as well as reasons for not to. And this is where you can really apply your free will and see which of the options are you going to choose. And then after all of this was said and done, and we said that, you know, the human being is basically 
preparing themselves. Everything that is being done here is being done here with the afterlife uh, in mind as an ultimate destination. We started looking at the journey of the human being towards this afterlife. We looked at the moments of death, the dying process. And we said even that dying process is not a specific point in time. It's actually a process which has a number of stages, right? And we went through the verses of the Holy Quran and very quickly some narrations to really understand that this is a process and it can be a very pleasant one, one where a human being is treated with respect and dignity and mercy as they leave this world and enter the next phase, the next stage of their existence. Or it can be a phase where a human being encounters all sorts of disrespect and harshness and rudeness because they don't deserve any respect as they depart from this world and enter into the new stage of their existence. And then we looked a little bit at the world of, you know, the after death uh, ensues, we looked at the world of the grave, the alam al-barzakh, with the different stages that actually take place there. There's a, a, a sort of an interrogation that happens, right? Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends these angels who are mandated with seeing to what extent did the human being actually, uh, in what state did they leave this world? And what type of uh, beliefs and intentions and uh, you know truths they are carrying as they enter into the next world and this this sets up the direction of the next while of the existence of the human being depending on how well you answer that interrogation and it's not of course a matter of you know speech and uttering answers uh, as much as it's carrying the truths within you that have become part of you that you are being able to manifest and represent and present to those angels. And this is really truly who you are as you enter into the next world that will determine in what type of state you are going to remain while you are in Alam al-Barzakh, this middle or intermediary world. And we set an extremely long journey at the end of which everyone who exists in this world, in this world meaning both Alam al-Barzakh or uh, our material, uh, uh, you know, uh, worldly life, all of this comes to an end. And then there is a new world that is created, Alam al Akhirah, an entirely new type of existence, an entirely new realm with its own rules, with its own principles, with its own laws. And uh, we looked at the big milestones that we go through as we rise from our graves, from our state of death and enter into that world and how human beings are taken from one station to another. There is a judgment, there is confusion initially, and then leading all the way up to the divine judgment. And there is a judgment, as we said, at the individual level. There's another one at the collective social level, uh, reminding us of our both individual as well as collective responsibilities. And then people are taken uh, in groups, groups are distinguished from each other, separated from each other, and they are ultimately taken to their final abode uh, of happiness or uh, misery for eternity, as we said. And again, uh, I, I hope we don't need to always repeat this, uh, that this is kind of a very quick overview. We're not going through the details. These are the broad strokes uh, of all of this. We're not going to give you know uh, the detailed explanation so that we can save a little bit of time. And so this is a very long and very serious journey awaiting us. And so to come back from this journey, we ask the question, if we have to choose between the two, which one do we choose? Between this world, prioritizing this world and prioritizing the next world. Which one do we choose? Which one do we prioritize? Which one are we actually prioritizing now? And so we looked at uh, a number of different characteristics uh, that define this world and we compared them with for specifically for those indicators for the afterlife to see because of the nature of this world. And today we're going to come back to that uh, at the end of the lesson, inshallah. Uh, we, we need that to go back to it and see, uh, you know, what does this how does this fit into the bigger picture and help us answer the question is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly neutral 
in the way that a human being is supposed to behave? Or is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pushing the human being much more in one direction as opposed to the other? And so all of this brought us to this complex question of what is ultimately the relationship between the two entities, the two realms, the two worlds? What is the relationship? And we said we need to look at that from different angles. One angle is simply to say the general relationship dictating, uh, you know, how we go from one to the other to understand our existence in this world and the next world. Generally speaking, one of the best metaphors to keep in mind, and as again, not something that we, I didn't come up with this, this is our religion. We find this metaphor again and again in the verses of the Holy Quran and the narrations uh, of the Holy Prophet and Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam that this world is a garden for the afterlife. And if it is a garden, it means that your job in this world is to lay the foundation, is to plant the seeds. And in the afterlife, you will only have access to those things which you planted in, the, in your life, you will have access to them in the afterlife. This will be the time for harvesting the fruits of your work, the fruits of your labor, and what you uh, you will be able to reap what you sow. And so then we looked at uh, the, the relationship between actions, beliefs in this world, those things that you are planting, and how they become reward or punishment in the afterlife. And we said there's a number of ways of understanding this. One of them is simply to say that it's a contractual relationship between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in which he basically says, you know, there's a contract between me, your creator and Lord, and you, my servants, in that if you perform certain acts as a matter of contract between us, as a matter of agreement between us, I'm telling you that if you do certain acts, you are going to get certain rewards or certain punishments. And so we said this is kind of a, a contractual agreement. Another way to look at that one is to say it's a matter of convention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simply decides that for doing act A, you receive reward X or punishment Y, for instance. And so this is another way of looking at it. But we said perhaps a more powerful, uh, spiritually uh, more challenging, but also more engaging way of understanding it is to say you're actually getting back the exact thing that you are putting in except that you are getting it back in its true form, which we call a reward or punishment. Uh, so uh, that prayer or that fast or that act of charity that you did uh, or that ugly behavior that you, you performed, uh, all of those things in themselves are given back to you, but they are given back to you in the afterlife in their true form, uh, not what you are seeing superficially, what they look like in this world. You are getting them back and their true state and their true form. And so um, this led us to start looking now a little bit more at what are the main ingredients. So all along we've been saying, you know, you have the right beliefs, you have the right intentions, you are doing the good, the correct deeds or incorrect deeds. What are we really talking about? And we said really there are two ingredients for all of this. You have your beliefs and intentions because these go together. The, those things that you carry in your heart, and then the actions that derive out of those deeds. We need to look at those two as being the, the main ingredients uh, that a human being can put in those things that you're planting in this world to harvest in the afterlife. They are one of two things. They are either beliefs and intentions, and you can include your knowledge in there, but really it's the beliefs and intentions and then you have your deeds that derive out of those beliefs and intentions. So with that in mind, we said we need to really understand what we mean when we say beliefs and intentions. And so we spent a little bit of time understanding what we mean by belief. What do we mean by iman or lack of iman? What does kufr mean? What are the different interpretations or different meanings to these words? And what do they mean? And what is the difference between knowledge and faith, for instance, ilm and iman? Uh, and then where does uh, action fit into all of this? And ultimately, after, after discussing all of this, 
we saw that there is a minimal threshold for belief. You need to have a minimal understanding of the general worldview that we talked about. You need to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that there is an afterlife because he is wise and just and that he has guided humanity to live in a certain way. He has not left people to live willy-nilly, randomly, however they wish, because he is God and because he has mercy and because he is just and wise, he would not leave human beings to live however they want to live and then reward them or punishment, punish them in the afterlife. Therefore, there must be guidance through prophethood, through revelation, uh, and those elements need to be met. So this constitutes your minimal threshold for belief. Anything on top of that is basically belief in the right direction. And we said there is an uh, infinitely high scale that a human being can climb on uh, and ascend to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their knowledge and in their belief and their sincerity towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is really and ultimately what Allah is looking at. Your eternal happiness depends on that belief that you are presenting to Allah and the intentions that arise of that belief. What do you want to do now that you know that you are a servant to a creator? What do you want to do now that you know that there is a creator who has done everything he can to guide you to move in a certain direction? What are your intentions now? What do you want to do with this now? This is what you are presenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But does this mean that we only talk about faith, we only talk about knowledge, we only talk about intentions, and we completely neglect deeds because deeds are useless. And we said, no, absolutely not. Both uh, your iman uh, and the intentions that go with it and the deeds, the actions that you perform, they are both playing an important role, except that these are playing different roles. That which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is assessing you on, your value and merit before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is entirely based on your beliefs and entirely based on your intentions. Except that those beliefs and intentions do not go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except through your deeds. It is the deeds that are going to anchor the belief and make it a part of you. It is your deeds that are going to show that this is actually something that has become part of your beliefs, part of who you truly are. Without the deeds in place, this is just a passing thought. It stays at the level of knowledge and leaves. You have not done anything with it to anchor it and make it really part of who you really are. Otherwise, you know, anything that is in passing, you have understood it, you have accepted it, but not enough to do anything about it. That has not really become a belief. And we gave multiple examples to talk about when you really believe something, how you actually change your behavior. You cannot continue to believe something and your behavior does not change. It means that belief has not really entered your heart. Your heart has not, or your soul has not really submitted to that uh, knowledge that has entered uh, entered you. And so uh, we also explained what we refer to as a vicious circle and a virtuous circle. And we, uh, you know, there is a certain pattern of having faith. If you acquire knowledge and you submit uh, spiritually heart, in your heart to that knowledge enough, then that has become uh, a weak form of faith that only increases with deeds. And if those deeds match that faith fully, then that faith is also going to increase, calling for more action. And this means that you are constantly, in a, if you actually take the opportunity and fulfill the work that goes with a certain level of iman, certain level of faith, that will only increase you in faith because you're acting on it. And the opposite is also true. When you are acting in a way that degrades, decreases, diminishes that faith or increases your kufr, your disbelief, then this is going to cause you to fall into a vicious spiral or vicious circle where you're constantly losing the light in your heart and constantly going towards more and more darkness. And we recited a number of narrations that uh, support this idea. And so Perhaps in all of this, this uh, insistence we said today, one of the misconceptions in the world is that there is a misconception because of the insistence of today's world on things like happiness and things like, you know, to what extent is something being of service to others. 
because people are so fixated on what is happening in this world that they don't really look at anything happening beyond this world. And so we said a lot of people may think that just because you have done something that has become of service to other human beings, then this means that necessarily this is going to translate into uh, eternal reward uh, for you. Uh, and this is what should become the indicator. Uh, but we said this is not uh, a complete way. This is a very incomplete way of, of looking at actions. When you look at something, you may look at the thing in itself, the act in itself, but that does not represent uh, what is actually happening in the world. In the world, you, you usually have an actor who, when they perform their act, they also have an intention. Was the intention behind the act aligned with belief that this is an act performed by a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a manner in which he wants you to behave? Or is this an act performed for uh, you know, uh, reasons based on my ego and what I want out of this world and the material desires and gains and reputation and, and uh, so on and so forth that I may want from this world? And we went through the verses of the Holy Quran and we explained that this is where the entire difference uh, uh, is made at the level of your intention and not necessarily at the level of what happens once you have performed a certain deed uh, or not. And then we talked about a topic that we said it may seem that it is technical. There's big repercussions on how we live our lives and that it can give a lot of hope uh, to someone who has all of us we fall in this category, someone who has a lot of sins and a lot of shortcomings and a lot of limitations and a lot of mistakes before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this was the topic of nullification and expiation, uh, takfir and ihbab. So we said, if you perform a sin, does this mean that this cancels out all the good that you've ever performed before? And we said that is not the case. Or the opposite, if you do something good, does it automatically erase all the bad that you've done before? And once again, we said that is not the case. Both continue to matter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deal with each uh, on their own. But there are acts that definitely have repercussions, effects on other acts. But those are only known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless he has explained those to us. And he has in a number of cases where he has told us for certain acts, there are conditions if those conditions are not met, the act is not accepted in the first place, for instance, right? So inshallah, that topic was clearly uh, understood. So now with all of this in mind, we come back to our question today. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately, and you know, this is perhaps not the most uh, reverential way, respectful way of asking the, this question about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but I'm trying to simplify the topic. I'm asking the question, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates the world that he has created, we've been saying all along from the beginning of this series that a human being now has a choice to make. The choice is either do good and therefore there's a reward or do bad and therefore there is a punishment. The question that we're asking when we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us, given us the free will, the ability to understand this, and he has put us in a world where we have access to both of these. The question is, has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stood equally to both of these options at the same distance, right in the middle, in a neutral way? So he has said, you know, human being, I have created you. I have explained things to you. I've given you reason and I've given you revelation, and I've explained to you that this is good and this is bad, and you're now on your own. You do good, you get good, you do bad, you get bad, and that's it. And the human being is put right in the middle, and it's a 50-50 uh, you know, distance that needs to be traveled on both sides. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remains uh, distanced and uh, kind of removing himself from the equation. Is this how things are to be understood? Uh, or is there kind of a bias? Is there more of a push, more of an incentive of the human being to go in one direction than the other? That's ultimately the question. And of course, I'm not gonna go through all of these ramifications, but once it's understood, inshallah, what we're trying to get at here, it will resolve a lot of other issues related to 
uh, generally speaking, our belief system and how we understand how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with this world and deals with us and our place in this world and so on and so forth. When we look at um, the nature of a human being, and this is what we're going to see, uh, in short, what we're going to present. First of all, if we look at the nature of the human being, we're going to see that the human being is pushed in a certain direction. And that direction is the good. When we look at the type of guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, we see that it makes us lean much more in one direction as opposed to the other. When we look at the very nature of this world, and this is, as we said, this is something that we've explored in the past. When we look at the nature of this world and we compare it to the nature of the afterlife, it should very easily and quickly make us lean towards one direction and one outcome much more than the other. And finally, and this is what we want to add to it today, is that if we see that there are additional incentives for being good, additional incentives for being a believer, then in those cases, we need to add those to the equation and say, here is more of a reason for being good and doing good, as opposed to losing out on these opportunities, missing out on these incentives and not doing those things. So inshallah, today we can add that to the entire discussion. So if we look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the entire system of existence, the entire system of creation. We said from the beginning when we talked about, you know, the, 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 the series of lectures that had to do with tawheed, with monotheism, with the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the topic related to, uh, you know, evil in the world, divine wisdom, divine mercy, divine justice. We said that Generally speaking, if we look at existence, we see that the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always associated with, is always attached to that which is good. Now, if we look at the world, we also notice that there are things that we may define as being harms, and sometimes we refer to them as being evil. And if anyone wants the detailed discussion of this, there's a long series of lectures that we gave specifically about the topic of evil in the world uh, or harm in the world. And we distinguish between all the different categories. Uh, so you can go back to those. But generally speaking, we said that when we notice that there are things that are harmful in this world, these are not created for themselves in that way. The harms that we are noticing, they are secondary. They are the outcome of something else. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates the world in such a way that yes, as a secondary uh, nature, there is also there will also be harms as part of that system. And we said this is part of the divine plan, the divine engineering to create a world where there is competition, where there is a, it's a world where there are limited resources. It's a world where harms can happen to us, things that we want don't happen, things that we don't want happen, and so on and so forth. But this is the type of world that it needs to be for it to be a world of test, a world of challenge, a world of uh, trial and tribulation for us to see which choices we're going to make and how we are going to behave in this world. So this is generally speaking the world in which we live, okay? But, but ultimately, and as a matter of principle, we said, the divine will is first and foremost associated with that which is good, not with the harms and with the, the things that we said are secondary and they have to happen as a result of the type of world that it is. It's a material world, okay? So that's a first point. Now, when we come to the human being specifically, again, the human being being part of this world, we see that in the case of the human being, the divine will is that the uh, human being is going to act to that, towards that which is good and which leads to his eternal, his or her eternal happiness. This is part of the order of the universe. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's general will is that everything moves towards the good. When we look at specifically the human being without that, within that system, we also say that the human being has been created so that he moves generally 
towards that which is his eternal good, his ultimate good. So there is no difference there. Just by the virtue of being part of this creation system, we have to say that the human being is also moving in that general direction with where the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that everything moves towards its ultimate good. Then, so the same explanation that we gave and that applies to the world also applies to the human being. How do we explain the harms? How do we explain the punishment of a human being, the unhappiness of a human being? The answer in short is that it is secondary because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to create this type of world in a world where we have free will, a world where you are given the choice to choose what you want to do and you are given the means to act out based on that will, then there must also be punishment because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we said, is also wise and is also just. And so those who do good cannot be treated like those who do bad. And we went through the entire series discussing, you know, the afterlife and the nature of the afterlife based on the necessity of the afterlife, based on divine wisdom and divine justice. So you can go back to the beginning of the series for more details on that. And so as a result of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choosing to give us a free will, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving us the choice to choose, then it is out of his mercy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, if he allows some to go to heaven, to exist and to choose the good so that they may go to heaven as a secondary nature, as a secondary derivative of this, there will also be those who are going to choose to go to hell. Those who choose punishment and unhappiness and eternal damnation, and that is their choice. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided to allow it. That said, when you go back again, as we said, to the very nature of our existence, the existence of this world, this is supposed to be a world that is ultimately moving towards the good. But because a human being has been given this freedom of will, the freedom to choose which direction to go, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed this human being to go ahead and reach the ultimate destiny that he has chosen for himself, which in certain cases is going to be an eternal unhappiness. If we look at a passage from Dua Kumail, Imam Ali alayhi salam, in that passage says, فَبِالْيَقِينِ أَقْطَعْ لَوْلَا مَا حَكَمْتَ بِهِ مِنْ تَعْدِيبِ جَاحِدِيكِ وَقَضَيْتَ بِهِ مِنْ أَخْلَادِ مُعَانِدِيكِ لَجَعَلْتَ النَّارَ كُلَّهَا بَرْدًا وَسَلَامًا وَمَا كَانَ لِأَحَدٍ فِيهَا مَقَرًّا وَلَا مُقَامًا Imam Ali alayhi salam says, speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I declare with certainty that were it not for what you have decreed concerning the chastisement of your deniers, the punishment of those who deny you, and what you have preordained concerning the everlasting home of those who stubbornly resist, if it wasn't for those things, you would have made the fire, all of it, coolness and safety. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to punish and harm and make people end up in hell and punish them for all of eternity. This is not what the purpose was from their creation. The purpose from their creation was that they recognize, they have all the tools so that they recognize their state of being in servitude as creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to act accordingly. And so this is the point for which they were created. And doing this would allow them to reach the highest levels of their own fulfillment and perfection in this world and the next. But because they have chosen, this is the ultimate. So Imam Ali alayhi salam says, and so there would not be a place called hell. There would not be, that's why he says, were it not for that promise that you made, were it not for your justice as we talked about, and were it not for your uh, wisdom, there would not be a place called fire because you don't want to punish anyone. But those people have chosen that path and you have promised that you will reward those who are good and those who are bad are going to be punished. So he says, you would have made the fire, all of it, coolness and safety. And no one would have a place of rest or abode within it. No one would be, Okay, and so the divine mercy means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates the human being. He also gives the human being freedom to choose. The creation of the human being is a mercy. The creation of the human being is a good in itself. 
The freedom to choose is an additional good in itself. It's a good that can lead, yes, to certain results if people choose those other results. But without that, there would not be a capacity, there would not be a potential for the human being to aspire to or reach the highest levels of perfection spiritually. Okay? So primarily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will has been associated with everyone reaching the good. And so this is something that, as we said, this is what we recognize in general and maybe perhaps philosophically. This also, if that is true, when we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will is that we reach the good, that human beings move towards that which is good, if there should be indications of this, if we look at the nature of this creation, that is a human being, and if we look at the religion, the laws that have been given, the taqween and the tashri'ah, we should be able to find traces of this. So it's not just an empty claim that we're making and not just the rational proof that we just presented, but there is more. So is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly neutral or not? Human nature, let us start with that. And as we said, we're going to look at nature. So generally speaking, <coughs> generally speaking, when we look at a human being, when we look at the nature of a human being, we see that, and this is proven again and again, you can look at sociology, you can look at psychology, the studies, the reports, the big thinkers in those fields, but you can also look at yourself. Any human being who has spent any time doing good versus any time doing bad, doing crime, doing things that make them feel guilty and awful and anxious and stressed and diseased and uh, isolated and all sorts of other disturbances, psychological uh, instability that is caused by doing anything harmful, anything negative, whether it's to themselves or to anyone else. This is something that is directly experienced by all of us. It doesn't need you know, a lengthy discussion. And the same thing can be said on the other side. If you do good, if you truly go out of your way to help someone else, for instance, you intuitively feel, you directly feel much better. You feel that you have done something good and it makes you feel good and you want to do more of it, okay? And anyone who helps others on a regular basis has felt this on a regular basis. In fact, in a lot of cases, this is what makes you come back because it has given you such a good feeling that you don't want to stop that feeling from happening again. In any case, so when we look at the nature of a human being, we see that the good has a much greater, much deeper, and much more positive beneficial impact on a human being than bad, than evil. Which means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already created the human being, hardwired the human being in a way that makes them lean towards that which is good. So that answers, it gives us a first point. When we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is he entirely neutral? Well, he's not neutral in the way he's created us because human beings intuitively, biologically, psychologically, socially, so on and so forth, we know that we want to move towards that which is good. And we despise and we hate and we feel guilty and unhappy and so on and so forth when we see, when we do anything that is negative and bad, okay? And as we said, in addition to feeling good, we recognize, we recognize the good and we recognize the bad and we want to move in one direction more than the other. So this is the nature of the human being. When we come to the laws, when we come to the level of legislation, the guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us as human beings, we see that this is also the case. First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and again and again, and today, unfortunately, we would require a series of lectures to explain this very short statement that we are going to make. Religion, the religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents to human beings is an easy thing for them to enact, for them to apply. Yes, in certain cases, we make it because of all sorts of different reasons. We make it as though it's something difficult and complex and so on and so forth. The truth is that it's supposed to be something natural 
intuitive, fully aligned with your nature, with who you truly are internally, very deep inside you as a human being. Okay, and this is where the ease of the religion is supposed to come from. And then when you look at the actual teachings of religion, you see that they are perfectly aligned with that nature, making them easy and simple and making you lead further towards them. So when you look at how you're hardwired, and then when you look at what you've been given externally in terms of guidance, which we refer to as religious teachings, we see that everything is pushing you to in one direction much more than the other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have created a religion that is extremely difficult so that he it becomes repulsive for you. It's not aligned with your nature. You don't naturally lean towards it. You don't recognize it intuitively. If that were the case, then we would say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not really being very, uh, you know, uh, incentivizing us, pushing us very much towards doing the good. He's put all these obstacles and difficulties in our way to get there. But then when you see how it truly is, you see that no, certainly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put all of these elements in place because he's is, is incentivizing. He wants to push us much more in one direction as opposed to the other. And so if we go through the verses of the Holy Quran, we see this loud and clear. In the verses in, in Surah Al-Rum, for instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and, and I'm not going to you know, comment so that we finish on time. I'm not going to comment on these verses very quickly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in 3030, 30, he says, Set your face to religion as someone who is hanif. And I'm intentionally saying the word hanif here so that inshallah one day we park it for now and one day we can come back to it and explain in much more detail what we mean by that. In the primordial nature, in the fitrah, that from God upon which he originated humankind, there is no, so by becoming hanif, you are simply aligning yourself with your fitrah, with the primordial nature upon which Allah has created all of humankind. There is no altering the creation of God. You can want, you can try as you may, you will never be able to, to change that hard wiring that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in you and that had made that makes you lean towards those things. That is the upright religion. That hanithiyya, that pure alignment, perfect alignment with your fitrah, that is the upright religion. But most of humankind do not know. In 91, Surah Al-Shams, وَنَفْسِ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا and by the soul and he who fashioned it, so as to inspire it to recognize its vices and its virtues. It's good and it's evil. What That which is good for it and that which is evil for it, harmful to it, damaging to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is swearing by this nafs that he has given us and the faculty of that nafs to recognize good and bad. So here we have different notions that we just talked about of those incentives that push the human being to recognize the good and want to do the good. And then when we look at the religion and why there is religion in the first place, why we were created, and then why we received guidance from Allah, is it so that it's difficult? Is it so that we go through the test of being religious? Let's look at the verses of the Quran. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yuridu Allah bikum al God desires ease for you. He does not desire hardship for you. In 2278, he has placed no hardship for you in religion. And in 56, Surah Al-Ma'idah, God desires not to place a burden upon you. He desires to purify you. This is the reason why you have this religion. It's so that you get purified by it, not so that you go through something difficult. And to complete his blessing. Allah wants to complete his blessing to you, but it has to go through this religion that you may perhaps give thanks. And if you give thanks, Allah does not get anything out of the thanks that you're giving. You are the one who benefits from it. This goes through religion. And in Surah An-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, God desires to make clear for you the reason why all of this is given, it's so that you get clarity, is that things become clear to you. 
God desires to make clear for you and to guide you to the traditions of those who went before you and to turn toward you in mercy. And God is knowing and wise. And again, in Surah An-Nisa, God desires to turn toward you in mercy. But those who follow lusts desire that you go tremendously astray. Wallahu yuridu an yatuba alaykum wa yuridu alladheena yattabi'oona ash-shahawat an tamilu maylan azima. And of course, again, all of these require, you know, a, a good time to meditate and contemplate and think about in addition to comment which we don't have time to do. So inshallah, you come back to those or at least you take them down and really think about these verses. Again, in Surah An-Nisa, God desires to lighten your burden for you. Yuridullahu and yukhaffitha ankum wa khuliqal insanu da'ifa. And who better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to know that the human being is weak. And so therefore, he, the one who created the human being in this nature that is weak, he is the one who says, I want to lighten your burden for you. I want to make things lighter, easier for you. Okay? And again, 8, 7, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So here, kalimate, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, God desires to confirm the truth with his words. His words can mean a number of things, including, you know, the revelation, including all the signs, including all religions, including the manner in which the world is created. All of these are signs or words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's so that he establishes the truth. And human beings, as we said, recognize the truth and move towards the truth. And that's why religion is given to us. And so again, perfect alignment with your hardwiring. All of this said, we can now turn to the next uh, criteria or the next indicator. The very nature of this world, as we said, anyone who studies this world will come to the conclusions that we established many lectures ago when we said that this is a world that is temporal. This is a world that is passing. This is an ephemeral world. It's frail. It has no stability. It's not fixed. Anyone can see this. It's constantly in movement. And then before you know it, the blink of an eye, everything is done and you have moved on. You're dead and you are in the next world. This enough, this should be enough, especially when you compare it to the nature of the afterlife to make you, to incentivize you to move towards one direction a lot more than the other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have created it differently, but this is how he chose to create it. So is this not an incentive? If you look at this world and you see that even when there are pleasures, those pleasures are really not very stable, not very worth it. They come at a price. There is a side effect and so on and so forth. And the pure pleasures do exist, except that they don't exist in this world. They exist in the afterlife. If you want them, work for them and you will get them in the afterlife. Is this not an incentive to move in that direction? And then if you look at this world in itself with everything in it, if you remove a few elements in the pillars of your worldview, you see that it no longer has any meaning. This world in itself is not created for itself. And human beings can actually reach this conclusion. Human beings have been in various philosophies have very clearly recognized that there is no meaning to this world. And so what's the solution? The solution is that we agree there is no meaning to this world if you remove the afterlife. You add an afterlife and you add a God and then everything makes perfect sense. Yes, this world does become meaningless. It does become absurd. It does lead to cynicism and pessimism and meaninglessness if those elements are removed. But when you put them back in, again, there is an incentive to move in a certain direction if you don't want to live this life of misery and loss and confusion leading to absurdism and all the different philosophies that go with it. And finally, as we said, in addition to all of this, we said that ultimately the choice that a human being is making is not going to be whether I choose that which is good or I choose nothing. It's not like someone tells you, you know, you could, there's a really good deal happening in that store. You should go and get a bargain. And you say, no, I choose not to. And so 
that's it. You just simply decide not to get something that is good. It's that there are no alternatives. Either you are choosing eternal happiness or by default, you are choosing eternal damnation and eternal unhappiness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, once again, could have created things differently, but he did not. And so this means that even for those who fail to see everything else, would you not say that there's an incentive here where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is once again pushing human beings one way or another through their deeper understanding or those who can't, even those who are superficial, they will understand as we say in our common parlance, we would say the carrot and the stick. There is a carrot and a stick that should move you. There is a reward and a punishment and there's nothing in between. So when you look at this and the nature of this life, as we said uh, a few lectures ago, you see that even that in itself is an incentive for all of us to move in one direction and not the other. Finally, I want to talk about this topic, which is the rewards. And this is limited to those who are believers in this world. If I look at this world, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly neutral? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it very clear that when he wants to reward or punish, he has also used the same principles that we've been talking about throughout to reward and punishment so that you clearly see that there is an incentive in one direction and not to the other. How? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it clear again and again and again in the Holy Quran, and you can add the narrations to it, that when you do bad, you get the reward or the punishment that goes with that bad end of story. One for one. You do one bad, you get one bad. You do one evil deed, you do one sin, you do one sayyah, you do one then, and it counts as one sayyah. Now let's look at if you do good. And you tell me, is this not an incentive? Is this not an incentive to do more good than bad? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you do good, and of course doing good, we're not going to repeat everything we've said about doing good only matters if you are doing it with the right intentions. But assuming that we have the right intention, someone who does good, what are they getting in return? In certain verses we are told, and I put them in these buckets and there could be a few other buckets, but let's just look at these. First is you always get better in quality than what you have put in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards you as though the quality of what you did was much better than what you did. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sa says, Man ja'a bil hasanati, whoever brings a good deed, he will have better than it. Falahu khayran minha. That's one. In another verse, he says, Man ja'a bil hasanati, falahu khayran minha. Wa man ja'a bil sayyati, fala yujza alladheena amal al sayyat illa ma kanu ya'malu. Whoever brings a good deed, he will have better than it. Okay, so good equals better than good. What if you do bad and whoever brings an evil deed, those who perform evil deeds shall only be recompensed for that which they have done. One to one. Is there not an incentive in this verse? Next one. There are verses that tell us that not only is are you rewarded in a reward that as though your deed was actually better, you were also rewarded as though you did a lot more good than what you actually did. So there is more quantity in addition to being more quality in your reward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And whoever performs a good deed, we shall increase it in good for him in Surah Al-Shura. And again, in Surah Yunus, husna was To those who have done good shall be that which is good and more besides it. In certain verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's not just more, we will double it for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is they who will be given the reward twice, twice over for their having been patient. And they repel evil with good and they spend from that which we have provided them. In another verse, he says, it will be multiplied, which means it's a lot more than 
just times two. It could be times three or four or five. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, surely Allah does not do injustice, not even the weight of a particle of dirt. And if there is any good, he multiplies it and gives from himself a great reward, for instance. So the great reward is just a multiplication. And then there are verses that say, it will be multiplied by 10. It's a tenfold that you are getting in reward for one single good deed. And again, who brings whoever brings a good deed, he shall have ten times the like thereof. But whoever brings a bad deed, he shall only be recompensed with the like thereof. If you look at these verses, would you not say that this is a clear incentive? If you go to a store and they tell you, today we have a deal. If you buy one, you get a little bit more. You get 1.25, you get 1.50. What if you get two for one? What if you get five for one? What if you get 10 for one? This is what you're getting here with the hasanat as opposed to the sayyat, which is still one for one. Is this not a clear incentive? In addition to all of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that for those who have the correct beliefs, who have the correct intentions, and who strive and work hard to stay away from the greater sins, those kaba'ir, or the sins where you are defiant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're doing it out of stubbornness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know that this is haram and you still proceed. It's not a moment of weakness. It's not a moment of forgetfulness. Those cases, they are counted as transgressing and being defiant of Allah. These are considered greater sins. And of course, you have the greater sins of killing and, and stealing and, and, and. These are the greater sins. If you stay away from those greater sins, you have the smaller sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you are good, you have the right intentions in life in general, and you stay away from the greater sins, I will forgive all of your smaller sins. Automatically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in tajtanibu kaba'ira ma tunhawna anhu nukaffir ankum sayyatikum wa nudkhilukum mudkhalan kareema. If you avoid the greater sins of that which you are forbidden, we shall absolve you of your misdeeds and admit you to an honorable admittance. And we talked about this topic, nukaffir ankum sayyatikum. It's as though they never happened. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you take care of the greater sins, you stay away of the greater sins, and we are going to absolve you of all of your misdeeds that are smaller. Okay? This is in Surah Al-Nisa. In Surah Al-Najm, that, that he may reward or requite those who do good with good, those who avoid greater sins and indecencies, Save the lapses, save that which is slight. Truly, your Lord is vast in forgiveness. So that he may require to those, there is a jaza that is given. So what about the smaller deeds? So long as you've stayed away from the big ones, the small ones are going to be forgiven, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. In addition to all of this, one more incentive that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps for those who are believers, those who do good, and those who stay away from those greater sins, is that you also get to benefit from the prayers and the gifts of others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there is a whole lot of prayer being done, praying being done by others for you. Those others can be angels. Those others can be prophets, imams, saints, good people, other believers, family members, friends, someone you helped on the street. When someone prays for you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he will take that prayer and give you reward for it. This is only if you are a believer and you have stayed away from the greater sins. In addition to this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says that um, others can actually send you gifts. And this can happen while you are alive and it can happen after you die. This continues. Someone can recite the Holy Quran and send the reward of that recitation to you. 
you've done something good for them. They remember how good you were. You taught them something. You gave them something. You took them out of a troublesome situation that they were in. You helped them in a hardship, whatever it may be. You remember that person. You prayed for them. You stand and pray two rak'at, qurbatan ila Allah. And you say, Ya Allah, I want the reward of these two rak'at as a gift sent to so and so. You remember a parent. You remember a relative, you remember a teacher, you remember a friend, and you perform a act of charity. And you say, Ya Allah, I want the reward. It's on behalf of so and so that I'm doing this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this person, the person who's doing this gets a reward. And that reward, a copy of that reward is taken and given to the person that you've sent this gift to. This is again, conditional on being a believer, then you get these additional incentives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in opposition to all of this, the people who don't meet the criteria for this, it does not work. You can do this all you want, it does not work. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Holy Prophet himself, imagine our dream would be that the Holy Prophet mentions us in a prayer that he thinks about us, that we may become a little part of a thought that he has. Imagine the Holy Prophet praying, wanting to pray, wanting to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive for some people, to forgive some people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, even if you did, I will not accept that asking of forgiveness for them. Why? Because they don't meet the original criteria of being actual believers with good intentions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Holy Prophet in Surah At-Tawbah, he tells him, استغفر لهم أو لا تستغفر لهم إن تستغفر لهم سبعين مرة فلن يغفر الله لهم Seek forgiveness for them or seek not forgiveness for them. If you seek forgiveness for them 70 times, God will not forgive them. That is because they disbelieve in God and his messenger. And God guides not those who are perversely rebellious. And again, in Surah 63, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Munafiqun, He says, it is the same for them, whether you ask forgiveness for them or you do not ask forgiveness for them. God will never forgive them. Why? Because they're hypocrites. Because they don't believe in Allah and they don't believe in His Messenger. So the conditions are not met. So again, once the conditions are met, would you not say that these are incentives and that you lose out on them if you do not meet those conditions. The final uh, item that I wanted to mention, but inshallah we will discuss it the next time we meet, is intercession. Intercession being the last of the series of incentives that you get because you are a believer. Because you are following what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to do, then you are going to meet the conditions for the last and the greatest of these incentives, which is a shafa'a intercession. And inshallah, we will talk about that the next time. I wanted to end with a narration from Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam. It's a beautiful narration. We are told in Bihar al-Anwar, we're told that they came to Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam and they told him, there is a man who is considered, you know, al-Hassan al-Basri was considered a very big scholar at his time. And he was alive during the life of a number of Imams, including Imam al-Sajjad, Imam Ali ibn al-Husayn, Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam. And they came to Imam Zayn al-Abideen and they told him that al-Hasan al-Basri says, لَيْسَ الْعَجَبُ مِمَّنْ هَلَكَ كَيْفَ هَلَكَ It is not awe-striking, it is not surprising of the one who has failed how they have failed. What is awe-striking, what is surprising, It is incredible that there is there are people who are actually being successful and saving themselves in this world. So Al-Hasan al-Basri thinks that this is a world where it is incredibly difficult to be good. And so it is awe-striking that there's anyone who can basically reach Jannah. And that... The, the, by default, everybody should be going in hell because it is awe-striking and incredible and surprising that there is anyone who could be reaching Jannah and being rescued. To this, Imam al-Sajjad answered. He says, 
إنما العجب ممن نجا كيف نجا فقال عليه السلام أنا أقول ليس العجب ممن نجا كيف نجا وأما وإنما العجب ممن هلك كيف هلك مع سعة رحمة الله إمام السجاد عليه السلام flipped the equation this completely changes your outlook and your worldview if you listen to Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, he says, and I say, contrarily to what Al-Hassan al-Basli says, and I say, Imam al-Sajjad says, it is not incredible that there is anyone who has been rescued, who has been saved, who has saved themselves and gotten to heaven. That's, there's nothing there. What is truly amazing and surprising and awe-striking, what is truly surprising is that there is anyone who ends up failing who, is, who ends up unsuccessful given ma'asi'ati rahmatullah, given the mercy of Allah. With all of the mercy of Allah, with all of the incentives that we mentioned, and inshallah we will mention the greater one of the intercession next time we meet, with all of that mercy, how can you still manage to fail? How can you still manage to be unsuccessful? And so if you think pessimistically, you think that you will never be rescued and saved, you have gone too far and we have talked about this again and again, this topic. Please always remind yourself of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remind yourself of this narration of Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam where he says, if al-Hasan al-Basri says it's incredible that anyone can be saved, I say, Imam al-Sajjad says, and I say it is incredible that anyone can be unsuccessful and that they perish and that they fail and they end up in hell. This is what is incredible, given the vastness of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will skip uh, over the repetition of the main points that we covered. Inshallah, they were all clear. You have them in front of you for those who are following on Zoom. They will be on, on uh, YouTube for, for the others if you want to follow uh, as a recap. And uh, let us stop here. It's almost prayer time.